Allah lecture. On behalf of Cesar Fernandez and Johan Voss, we're here to introduce you one of the very illustrious speakers here who's going to speak here, Dr. Anu Kumar, the president and CEO of IPAS. The lecture, Mahmoud Fatala lecture, was, he was a FIGO president you're all aware of. We keep on quoting him for everything that we do in, from 1994 to 1997. This lecture, Mahmoud Fatala lecture, was inaugurated in 2015. And the speaker is recognized for making a difference for women's health and their rights, regardless of the resources available. In 2015, the lecture was in the body of the world given by Eve Ensler. Today, we have Dr. Anu Kumar, who's going to give a presentation, Centrality of Reproductive Health and Choice in Women's Lives. And may I request Yuan Voss to introduce the speaker. Dear delegates, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kumar. Dr. Kumar, an anthropologist and public health expert, joined IPAS in 1992 and now serves as the president and CEO. Her wide-ranging role at IPAS, a global health organization focused on safe abortion care, include leadership of technical innovation, development, long-range strategy, and oversight of global partnerships. After conducting field research in North India as a Fulbright scholar in the early 1990s, Dr. Kumar began her career in public health, working as a social scientist at the World Health Organization. She later became a program officer with the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, where her work included developing the foundation's grant-making strategies in areas including global reproductive health and rights. Today, she is recognized as a thought leader in the field of reproductive health and rights, speaking frequently at global forums and publishing in blogs and peer-reviewed journals. A 2009 article she co-authored established the definition and framework for the phenomenon of abortion stigma, creating a new era of focus for scholars and advocates. She is also among those speaking out about the critical need to ensure that abortion and contraception services are available to women in humanitarian settings such as the Rohingya refugee camps in Bangladesh. And she is unwavering and unapologetic voice for human rights of women, which she believes are essential for a functioning democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great pleasure inviting Dr. Kumar. Thank you all so much. So, um, before I begin, let me first thank, of course, Vigo for inviting me for this uh, very uh, prestigious honor. And a special thanks to Dr. Nazar Sharir for facilitating this opportunity. Like many of you, of you, I have met and know Dr. Fatala and have greatly admired him for many years, especially his incredible commitment to women's health and women's rights. All of you in this room have dedicated your lives and your careers to reproductive health. The health services you provide to women are so critical and so essential. But what I want to think about today and help us to ponder for the next 45 minutes or so is to put that care into a larger context. When you provide care for a woman, you see her at a single moment in her life. You see her as she walks in the door of your exam room or your clinic. And while that moment is very important and is of utmost important to her, importance to her that she gets the highest quality of care possible, she's not necessarily sharing with you all the complexity and richness of her life. That may not come in the exam room with her. But because we cannot know everything that a woman brings with her, we have to be able to 
trust her in her decisions, and know that she's making the best decisions for her life. So it's so important that in that moment, we really fully, completely, and utterly trust women, because in so many aspects of our lives, women are not trusted, and our decisions are not respected. Women's decisions about the workplace, about in the political arena, these are not always respected. And so when it comes to these fundamental decisions about pregnancy and childbirth, it is of critical importance that women's voices are heard. So I'm going to start the talk with a little bit of a quiz. I hope you're awake. Um, I want to start by uh, making a central, uh, a central fact, which is that women in the developing world spend a lot more time being pregnant than women in the developed countries. So let me ask you, how many, what do you think the fertility rate is in Afghanistan? So we're going to do this by applause, it's the applause meter. How many of you think it's A, 3.7? How many of you think it's B, 2.5? Mm, not so many of you, all right. How about C, 4.8? Well done, Figo. <laughs> that is correct, C, 4.8. That is nearly three and a half years spent in pregnancy. That's a lot of time. Imagine if while you were in medical school, you were pregnant for three and a half of those years. Globally, the fertility rate is 2.5 children per woman, but there's huge global disparities. In Central America, we see a fertility rate of 2.3, while in Africa, it's 4.6. Now let's think about girls. And another quiz. How many girls younger than 16 in developing countries give birth every year? How many of you think it's a million? Ooh. How about two million? How many of you think it's two and a half million? Well done. Two and a half million girls under the age of 16 are giving birth every year. And if we look at the broader category of young women ages 15 to 19, 16 million are giving birth every year. Complications during pregnancy and childbirth are the leading cause of death for women and girls in this age range. And every year, nearly four million of them will have unsafe abortions. These facts have a profound impact on the lives of women and girls, and it's very different depending on where you live. So let's think about the lives of individual women. I'll tell you a story, a story about a girl named Mila who lives in the Netherlands. There's a high likelihood, where, where I should say the fertility rate is quite low, at only 1.6. So in the Netherlands, there's a high likelihood that Mila will finish high school. She'll, and she'll probably go on to get a university degree. Nearly half of Dutch women aged 25 to 45 have at least a bachelor's degree. During her primary and secondary school years, Mila will receive comprehensive sexuality education. It was introduced into the Dutch schools in the 1970s and has been legally required since 2012. If she wants it, Mila can have contraception for free. In the Netherlands, the pill is available for free for all women and girls under the age of 21. And contraceptive use is high, with nearly three quarters of married women using contraception. If Mila needs an abortion, she can get a safe and legal one. Abortion is legal up to approximately 24 weeks, and medical abortion is available upon request. These progressive abortion laws might make you think that there are lots and lots of abortions taking place in the Netherlands, but the opposite is true. The abortion rate in the Netherlands is very low, only eight per 1,000 1, women. But let's say Mila becomes pregnant and she wants to carry the pregnancy to term. In that case, she can get good quality maternal health care. Health care in the Netherlands is free for children under the age of 18 through their parents' public insurance program. The maternal mortality ratio in the Netherlands is very low, seven per 100,000 women. Because Mila has had the opportunity to have an education and go to college, she can enter the workforce. And if she has children, she will be able to get comprehensive childcare. Mila is also able to earn a good living. Young women in the Netherlands who work full time often earn more than men of the same age because they are better educated. 
So as she ages, Mila can earn money, she can contribute to her community and her country, and her life expectancy is 83 years. Now let's consider the path of a girl named Lusolo, who's growing up in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where the fertility rate is 6.3. Unlike Mila, Lusolo may grow up in a conflict zone. Decades of war and internal strife in the DRC have left millions of people in need of humanitarian assistance. In fact, the conditions are so bad in the DRC for women and girls that the International Rescue Committee has named it one of the five toughest places to be a woman in the world today. So let's see what Lusolo faces. It's likely that she will not get a high school education. Only one in three girls in low-income countries will actually complete even lower secondary education. If she does happen to go to school, it's very unlikely that she will receive comprehensive sexuality education unless there happens to be an NGO working in the area where she's growing up. Lucello is not likely to have access to contraception. The unmet need for contraception among adolescents is 23 million. And in the DRC, only 8% of married women between the ages of 15 and 49 are using modern methods. A study by the Guttmacher Institute in 2017 on contraception and unintended pregnancy, only in Kinshasa, found that 72% of married women, 72% said that they didn't want to have a child, they didn't want to be pregnant, but only 23% are actually using a method of contraception. So, in 2016, it was found that there were over 340,000 unintended pregnancies just in Kinshasa. And sexual violence is an ever-present threat for women and girls, with 60% of adolescent girls in South Kivu experiencing this in the past year. If Luzolo has an unintended pregnancy and needs an abortion, it's very likely that she will have to risk her life to get one. Until just a few months ago, abortion was legally restricted in the DRC, but that didn't mean it didn't happen. Women often resorted to unsafe abortions. We don't actually know what the abortion rate is in the DRC, but we do know that the rate in Kinshasa is 56 per 1,000, which is one of the highest in the world. Lucilla will probably have her first child as a teenager, and she will not get very good antenatal care. A study has found that in four zones of the DRC, less than half of women got four antenatal care visits and only 15% received postnatal care. So after having her first child as a teenager, Lucello is likely to have four more children and with each pregnancy, she will risk her life. If somehow she does manage to get a job, her earnings will be quite minimal. Employment is available for women and girls primarily in the informal sector or the agricultural sector, and very likely she will have to turn over her earnings to her husband. As she ages, Lucilla's lack of education and job opportunities, combined with her multiple pregnancies, will mean a life of poverty. And we know that maternal education and economic status has a great impact on the lives of children. So Lucilla's children are also likely to be poor and uneducated. Because of all those pregnancies and the possibility that she might seek out unsafe abortions, her risk of death is high. The maternal mortality ratio in the DRC is 693. Lucilla's life expectancy is 61 years. So why is her path so much different than Mila's? It's because there are so many forces that are working against her So let's talk a little bit about these forces. First, let's think about why girls and women in countries are so, ha don't have access to good health care, why they're so poor, why they don't have access to contraception. We know all of these things, we've seen the indicators, but why? Let's dig a little bit deeper. Why are they uneducated? Why are they so poor? Of course, the answers are complicated, and they have to do with patriarchy, discrimination, history, racism, discrimination, stigma, power, much more than I'm going to be able to talk about here. And there's no doubt that we've made a lot of progress in, in all of those things. But we still must acknowledge that even today in the 21st century, women and girls still have very little decision-making over the fundamental aspects of their lives. 
For girls like Lucello in the DRC, this lack of power harms them in myriad ways. At the interpersonal level, they have to deal with family expectations from their parents, siblings, and, and uh, partners about who they're allowed to marry, about what the appropriate role is for a woman and girl. Many girls, for instance, as we just heard from our previous speaker, are still expected to marry very young. Every minute, 23 girls under the age of 18 get married. Nearly 1,400 girls will have been married just in the time that I'm speaking to you today. At the community level, norms can encourage women to give birth shortly after marriage, or they may be encouraged to continue to have pregnancies and give birth until they, give, until they have a boy. In many cultures, women still do not make fundamental decisions for themselves about using modern contraception or abortion. And even in countries where abortion and, and, and contraception are available and legally permissible, they still ha may have to ask for, their, for the permission of their husbands or their partners or their parents or doctors. Whether they get that permission can be a matter of life and death. The Guttmacher Institute has said that fully meeting the need of unmet contraception in the world would lead to thousands of women's lives being saved, over 70,000 in fact. At the societal level, no matter a woman's age, no matter her economic status or her educational status, no matter where she lives, women and girls must contend on a daily basis with sexual harassment, abuse, rape, and other forms of gender-based violence. In Mexico, IPAS did a study looking at the re relationship between sexual violence and child pregnancy. We often assume that young boys and girls are having consensual sex without using contraception, and this is the reason for the high rates of very young teenagers becoming pregnant. The study, in fact, found that these pregnancies are often the result of girls being coerced by older men into sex. When you add it all up, it means that women are not able to realize their reproductive rights, and this is a societal failure. Dr. Fatala understood so well that women's rights are human rights and that human rights are about power. One severe consequence of that lack of power are the thousands of deaths and millions of injuries caused by unsafe abortion, almost all of them in the global south. Women and adolescent girls carry the burden of pregnancy and childbirth and they will literally do just about anything to end an unwanted pregnancy. I'm sure you have heard or even seen Girls who have used bleach, ground glass, or sticks. Even asking their partners to punch them in the belly until, they're, until they lose their pregnancy. That last example is a true story, by the way, of a girl in the United States. The levels and layers that are surrounding women can constrain or liberate them. This can be a circle of support, as it is for Mila, or it can be a circle that constrains and strangles opportunity. We know that when we have a circle of support, that women and girls will flourish. That's not just my opinion. Research has repeatedly shown that empowering women is good for children and their families, and it has economic benefits for countries. The diagram that you're seeing is a visual description of the context in which women and girls live. It's a sociological version, and it assumes a stable family, community, and society. But of course, there are many upheavals that women and girls experience, and many barriers that they face. I'll now turn my attention to some of those hard realities. And one of those is that there are so many people who are displaced from their homes right now and living in refugee camps and other humanitarian settings. So, just to make sure you're awake, time for another quiz. How many of you, how many people do you know, do you think are women and girls of reproductive age are living in humanitarian settings around the world? How many of you think it's A, 16 million? Nobody, nobody thinks it's 16 million. 34 million. 23 million. Vigo, you're, bat you're batting really well. B, 34 million, you people are extremely well read, obviously. All right, here's a, here's a trick question. Well, it's not really a trick question. What is the average time that people live in humanitarian settings? How many of you think it's A, 20 years? 
How many of you think it's B, eight years? And how many of you think it's C, 15? I got you. Sadly, it's 20 years. 20 years is the average time that people are living in humanitarian settings around the world. 20 years is a big chunk of time of, out of anyone's life, but for a young person, that is a huge amount of their reproductive lives. As the number of people living in crisis settings keeps growing, it's imperative that we do more to meet their reproductive health needs. One of the world's largest refugee camps is in Bangladesh, where nearly a, a million Rohingya refugees have fled Myanmar. Let me share with you a true story of one of the women. In August 2017, the violence in Myanmar reached the home of Noor. Her husband was at the mosque. While she stayed home to pray, suddenly she heard villagers scream and the sound of gunshots. She took her son and ran from her house. Just after she ran, a rocket launcher struck the house, setting it on fire. Everyone was running. Noor ran with her neighbors, but was slowed down because of her child. Three men from the military caught her and violently raped her in front of her son. Noor managed to escape, but that day she lost her husband, her father, a brother, a brother-in-law. Her son still cries for his father. Noor made her way to Bangladesh, walking for 10 days. When she arrived at the refugee camps, she realized that she was pregnant. She did not want to keep the child. She felt that it would be a sin to bring a rapist child into the world. At the health facility in the camps, she was able to terminate the pregnancy safely, receiving menstrual regulation services, as abortion is known in Bangladesh. This experience, and that of so many millions of women and girls fleeing uh, Myanmar for Bangladesh is the reason why the Rohingya women are in fact rated the, as the number one most difficult place to live right now. The refugee camps are rated the toughest place to live right now by the IRC. Many people assume that providing contraception and abortion care in these settings is just too difficult, but that is not the case. Working with the government of Bangladesh, my colleagues at IPASS, have responded to the need of contraceptive care in the camps and the surrounding areas. I Pass Bangladesh is working in 37 health facilities and have trained 112 clinical providers on menstrual regulation, post-abortion care, and contraceptive provision. To date, more than 3,100 Rohingya women have received care, and abortion and post-abortion care, and over 3,500 have received contraception. Noor, the woman that you just saw, was one of these women. The enormity of this crisis can be overwhelming, but the need is also overwhelming. And it's our job to help meet that need. It's one of the major challenges our planet is facing today. Another challenge that we face is that the criminalization of abortion continues. I'm gonna play a very short video it's quick, it goes very fast, so I ask that you pay attention. No. Didn't play. Can anyone in the tech support get, figure out how to make the video play? It's a good one. They're working on it. Are you for or against abortion? Contra. 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 Totalmente contra. Do you know anyone who has ever had an abortion? Yes. Conheço. 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 Várias pessoas. Should that person be arrested?
Are you for or against abortion? Contra. 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 Totalmente contra. Abortion is not a crime. Women have terminated unwanted pregnancies throughout history. Abortion is one of the oldest medical practices dating back to ancient Egypt, Greece, and Rome. It's a normal experience for women during their reproductive years. But what is fairly recent in terms of histor history is the criminalization of women and providers for seeking or providing abortion care and then putting them in prison for doing it. Right now, nearly one quarter of the world's population lives in countries with restrictive abortion laws where abortion is either prohibited entirely or only allowed to save the life of the woman. Most of these countries are in the global south. The stated goal of these restrictive laws is to reduce the number of abortions. But that's not what actually happens. The abortion rates are actually higher in places with restrictive laws or where abortion is banned altogether and only permitted to save the life of the woman. That's the case here in Brazil, where abortion is highly restricted. The Brazilian National Abortion Survey of 2016 found, and I quote, abortion is a common and persistent occurrence among women of all social classes, racial groups, educational levels, and religions. In 2016, almost one in five women had undergone at least one abortion by the age of 40. The survey concludes, and again I quote, considering that a large number of abortions are illegal and therefore performed without proper health and safety measures, these numbers indisputably make abortion one of the biggest public health problems in Brazil. This is a serious challenge for the reproductive health community. But I'm happy to report that there is progress. In August, the Supreme Court of Brazil held a historic public hearing on the topic of abortion and heard legal arguments and evidence from human rights leaders, public health experts, and others. It was the first time that the Brazilian Supreme Court had listened to such a wide array of arguments, and this gives me hope. In Argentina, we've also seen a positive movement toward lessening restrictions on abortion. A bill legalizing abortion, elective abortion up to 14 weeks was passed in the lower house of the Argentinian parliament. It was ultimately defeated in the Senate, but the movement for safe abortion is growing and shows no signs of being stopped. In Ireland earlier this year, the people voted to repeal a constitutional amendment that made abortion illegal. And And still another step forward occurred actually in the DRC. After years and months of advocacy by local and national groups and IPAS, we were, the, uh, the Maputo Protocol was passed in the DRC, which expands the legal uh, routes for abortion in that country, which means that girls like Lusola will now have a better chance to control their reproductive lives and their futures. And so while we are hopeful and we see images of, uh -oh. We see images of the women's movement in Argentina and elsewhere being very active and taking to the streets. I do want to remind us. Yes. Yes. Yeah. There is a growing and global opposition to, to safe abortion. And it is very active. It's very active right here in Brazil, right now during this election season. The opposition is also active in Argentina, Mexico, Europe, and Africa. Much of this opposition is supported financially and intellectually by the United States. Some of the opposition groups are legal organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom. Some are Catholic grassroots organizations like Human Life International. And there are youth groups like the World Youth Alliance. They have different constituencies, but they share a common goal. They want to limit access to reproductive health services. They want to curtail women's rights and the rights of LGBT individuals. They claim that human rights are not universal and that reproductive rights are a Western construct. They even go so far as to say that abortion and contraception destroys families and will end civilization. Tell that to the woman in Kenya who is dying from hemorrhage due to a sharp stick that she's used to end an unwanted pregnancy. I want to be clear. The anti-abortion movement wants to control women, they want to silence women, and they want to render us invisible. We cannot let that happen. <laughs> a 
And still another challenge that we face that we see very deftly used by the opposition movement is abortion stigma. What do I mean when I say abortion stigma? Abortion stigma is a negative attribute that's ascribed to women who seek to terminate a pregnancy and that marks them internally or externally as inferior to the ideals of womanhood. <clears throat> Why are they inferior? Because they're not doing what women are supposed to be doing. Choosing not to give birth goes against essential assumptions about the nature of womanhood, that female sexuality only exists solely for procreation, and that women are perpetual life givers. Abortion challenges the moral order, and the stigma surrounding it results in discrimination. The impact of abortion stigma extends far beyond women. It marginalizes abortion care, facilities, providers, it shames and silences women and providers and is a major contributor to unsafe abortion. Though stigma is pervasive and operates in multiple levels and it's just beginning to be understood, but I think you know it when you see it. In the US and in other countries, women are walking, who are walking into clinics are harassed. Providers of abortion care are stalked, threatened, or even assassinated. In some countries, women who have an abortion are seen as contagious or contaminated. For the anti-abortion activists, abortion stigma is a prime weapon in their arsenal. They want to stigmatize abortion by passing laws about it. They want to tell providers what to say and what they can do about abortion, and they want to make women feel ashamed. They don't want abortion to be seen as a normal part of women's health care. Let me give you an example of the impact. This past August in Zambia, a woman was referred to a general hospital from a clinic. She was 21 years old, and for the past two days, she'd been having vomiting, diarrhea, and abdominal pain. She had no history of being pregnant, and she reported her last menstrual period was about four weeks ago. She was admitted with a diagnosis of acute gastroenteritis with dehydration. The next day, a scan found an 18-week intrauterine fetus with no cardiac activity, intrauterine death. She was transferred to the gynecology ward. The following day, so now she's been receiving medical care for two days, the young woman was examined and found to have a high pulse, a high blood pressure, clammy skin, and nasal flaring. She was given my misoprostol to treat her failed pregnancy and given a blood transfusion, oxygen, and saline. After counseling, she revealed that she had taken some drugs that she couldn't remember the name of to end her pregnancy. Two days later, so four days, an MVA was performed to evacuate the uterus. After the procedure, her condition deteriorated. She went into septic shock and was transferred to still another hospital where she died upon arrival. So what happened here? Abortion is legal in Zambia. In fact, Zambia has one of the most progressive laws in Africa, and safe services are available. So why did this young woman not seek out care? Why did she feel that she could not immediately tell her doctors what had happened? Why was so much secrecy ne necessary, and why did no one treat her immediately? It's because abortion is so highly stigmatized in Zambia. Despite the legality, despite the services being available, many women still feel that abortion is something to be hidden and not discussed. The secrecy and silence is killing them. The young woman in Zambia tried to terminate her pregnancy with drugs that were ineffective and unsafe. What if she had talked to someone who had given her good information and she had gotten the right drugs? I raise this point because I want to talk about medical abortion and its power to give women more control over their reproductive health and lives. Medical abortion has transformed the abortion lands landscape, providing women an option to surgical abortion and the option to have the abortion at home. Medical abortion is extremely safe and effective. When the drugs mifepristone and misoprostol are used in combination, medical abortion is 98% effective in the first 10 weeks of pregnancy. Even if mifepristone is not available, misoprostol alone is safe to use and is 85 to 90 percent effective. Especially for women living in countries with restrictive abortion laws, medical abortion provides a safe and discreet way to terminate a pregnancy. In fact, the World Health Organization 
has attributed radical abortion for saving the lives of women by making abortion safer, and particularly in low resource settings. But I think we need to acknowledge the history of medical abortion, which is a history of women's innovation. The history of medical abortion, and that is misoprostol use, actually dates to the 1990s and stems from here in Brazil. Women living under criminal abortion laws here realized that they could use Cytotec for abortion. It was sold over the counter to treat gastric ulcers and included a warning that it may cause, uh, it may induce an abortion in pregnant women. Women began to pass on this knowledge through word of mouth. Now they're using hotlines, mobile phones, and the internet to spread the word. Through these informal networks, women are sharing information with each other about how to safely end unintended pregnancies on their own terms. Now we in the public health and medical communities are trying to catch up to women's innovation. And there are a number of groups that are working to bring this information and pills to help women around the world. Groups like Women Help Women, Women on Web, Safe to Choose, and researchers are working to generate new evidence and sharing exi existing evidence on self-use of medical abortion. Self-use is also often called self-managed medical abortion or medical abortion outside the health system. And it can include mifepristone plus misoprostol or misoprostol alone. I know there are many of you in this room, many doctors around the world, who have questions and concerns about medical abortion self-use. And I know many of you may be hesitant and frankly concerned about women using medical abortion without uh, the health system or, or without a doctor's care. I understand that concern, but we cannot ignore the fact that self-use of medical abortion is happening. It's an indication of the demand for abortion, and that demand is not being met because of the lack of access, stigma, and laws against abortion. So yes, I and other advocates are aware of the concerns related to self-use of medical abortion, but we also know all too well that women will do what it takes to end an unwanted pregnancy. And we know that self-use of medical abortion pills are far safer than sticks or herbs or abortion from an unskilled or untrained provider. So all of you providers out there, I ask you to consider what your role is in this. Are you going to be Worried that the woman doesn't have the right information? Yes. But is it your job to judge her because she doesn't have the information or because she wasn't able to get the right pills? Or is it your job to help facilitate her desires and her decisions? So I emailed Dr. Fatala prior to this conference and asked him if he had any words of wisdom for me before his talk. He referred me back to a presentation he gave at FIGO World Congress in Copenhagen in 1997, 21 years ago, and where he said, quote, FIGO is committed to stand beside women and to stand behind women in their struggle for their human rights. Women can rely upon us when they look, when they look for supporters of their just cause. We will always be standing up, ready to be counted. 21 years later, I think that is still FIGO's call to action. My hope is that all of us will leave today thinking about what kind of path and circle of support we can create for the young women and girls that we encounter in our lives. A path where women and girls can make their own choices and a path that is filled with possibilities and hope. We must stand up for women, and we must, most of all, remember Dr. Fatala's prescription for women. Power. There we go. After a long career in women's health care, Dr. Fatala said, if I'm asked to write only one prescription for women, my prescription will be a single word. Power. Give women power in their life, and they will pursue health. So I ask each of you, as providers, advocates, researchers, to do what you can to ensure that women and girls have power. Thank you.
Congratulations, Dr. Kumar, for your important job and very nice and rational and critical uh, presentation today for us in FIGO Congress. I, am, uh, I represent the Brazilian gynecology and obstetrics here. I am the president of Sebral Group, of Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecologists uh, in our country. And for us, it's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, receive you uh, in Brazil. Welcome. And uh, uh, in beh behalf of FIGO, and for us, uh, plaque commemorative for your stay, your presentation for us. Congratulations, Dr. Kuman and Dr. Purandari for the initiative. Thank you. 